Well, good morning, everyone. The Lord be with you. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Only a few. This is the week of Christmas. We celebrate Christmas, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ this week. It's a fantastic time of the year, despite the uncertainty and anxiety around us. We celebrate something that is rock certain, and that is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners like us. Uh, in Luke chapter 2, uh, the angel said to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. We're going to stand and sing once again, O little town of Bethlehem. Please stand as we sing.
Please be seated, everyone. What a great way to start our time together on this Sunday before Christmas. Raise your hand if you like Christmas. I love it. It's great to see that you're enthusiastic about it after such a year, that the year that we've had this year. And uh, we uh, love to remember uh, God's love to us and the sending of his son, the Lord Jesus. In 1 John, in the New Testament, we read in 1 John chapter 2, the Apostle John writes, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I'm going to invite you to join with me in this prayer of confession as God's people. Together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, in Psalm 103 we read, As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We come now to a time of prayer and uh, this morning I'll be praying for uh, some things that are very obvious to us at the current time. I'll be leading in prayer uh, for uh, the ongoing struggle that we have with the coronavirus uh, locally and around the world, especially praying for the uh, northern beaches today. Uh, all the Anglican churches on the northern beaches have closed today and have gone online. Uh, at very short notice as of uh, yesterday afternoon and uh, so we need to uphold them in prayer. Um, also I'll be uh, leading in prayer for our uh, witness this Christmas uh, as a church and then finally I'll be leading in prayer uh, for our dear sister in Christ Elsie uh, because Elsie, this is Elsie's last Sunday with us and um, next month we'll be praying for Jim as she begins her new ministry at the University of Sydney, but as I announced last Sunday, Elsie commences a new ministry next year uh, at the University of Tasmania in Hobart uh, amongst university students, and uh, I'll be leading in prayer for her this morning. Let's bow our heads in pray and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, your, your word reminds us that you are the God of all compassion and comfort, the scriptures also teach us that you listen to our prayers. We pray this morning once again for our world, our nation, our city and our church as the coronavirus continues to impact lives. We pray, Father, for churches in the United Kingdom this Christmas given the further imposing of restrictions in London and other parts of the UK, we ask, Lord, that you will strengthen the witness of Christians in these difficult times. And we pray that you'll restrain the spread of the coronavirus in the UK, in Europe and in other parts of the world. Please bring help to the northern beaches in Sydney this week. We pray that you will heal those who are afflicted by the virus and give wisdom and care to all who have the responsibility for looking after those affected and the local communities. We pray too for the churches on the northern beaches this morning, that you will guide and direct them, especially in the lead up to this Christmas time. We pray that you will give wisdom to the Premier of New South Wales and to the Minister for Health and to others as they make decisions today uh, that will impact uh, the celebration of Christmas, not only on the northern beaches, but of course across the city of Sydney and beyond this week. Father, we know that these are uncertain and anxious times. We pray that you'll help our world 
to look to security in your son Jesus and give us courage as we point others to the one in whom there is always hope in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And for our witness this Christmas. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we remember at this Christmas time that your son left his heavenly glory to be born into our world in humility as the servant king. In your mercy, we ask that you would open the hearts and minds of family, friends, neighbours and colleagues to the truth about Jesus this year. Help us as Christians to be courageous, not timid. Help us to be clear, not ambiguous in our conversation and witness. Help us to be alert and not complacent to the opportunities around us. Please use our Christmas services here at Sylvania to aid and support our own personal witness. Use the clear communication of your word, our organisation, our gifts and our loving service to direct others to the Jesus who died for them. Please rescue men, women and children from judgment and hell. Remove spiritual blindness. Enable people to see that the biggest problems in our world lie not in the coronavirus or global warming or even in faltering economies, but in our rebellious hearts towards you. By your grace, draw all those whom you have chosen to eternal life to know forgiveness in Jesus, your son. In his name we pray. Amen. And we also pray for our sister Elsie Anderson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the energetic and faithful ministry of the Australian Fellowship for Evangelical Students on university campuses across Australia. We praise you for Elsie's upcoming ministry on the university campus in Hobart. We ask that you would grant her all the energy, grace and wisdom she needs as she makes her transition back to her home state and forges good relationships with fellow workers and local churches. We thank you very much for her presence and ministry to us during this unusual year in our congregations, our growth groups and online. And thank you for her personal ministry as she has shared Jesus and cared for others. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's join together in saying our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, in a few moments' time, we're going to have our uh, Bible reading and Andy's going to bring us our third uh, part in our series on the church. Uh, but before Elsie brings us the Bible reading from 1 Peter, we're going to stand and affirm what we believe in these great words from Colossians chapter 2. So please stand with me. Together. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Amen. Please be seated. Thanks, Elsie. This morning we'll be reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 4. So 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 4. 
As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honour is for you who believe. So the, uh, sorry, I'll start that again. So the honour is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good day, everyone. It is lovely to be with you. Uh, always a privilege to gather as God's people and uh, looking forward to sharing with you uh, this last part in this series. I trust you've got some outlines there. I hope you do. Uh, Bibles as well. And uh, certainly all the, the references will be up on the screen for you to follow. Let me pray for us as we look at God's word together. Father God, thank you for speaking to us. And again, we pray that these words are uh, will not merely go into our ears and out again, but Father, you are shaping us and changing us, uh, rebuking and correcting and encouraging us uh, to be more like Jesus. And we pray that you are doing that work in us this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I suspect it's the same for you, but in my experience, uh, the most common misunderstanding when it comes to church is that people think building rather than community. Right? You say the word church and people think building rather than community. I mean, people will say things like, oh, I really love Coptic or Gothic churches. When what they're talking about is architecture, right? Buildings. Uh, go to Adelaide and they'll talk about that being called the city of what? City of churches, of course. Some of you might have been watching some coverage from Adelaide last night. Uh, but of course, they're not talking about a place that contains lots of Christians, are they? Though there are Christians there, and we praise God for them, but that's not what they're talking about. It's talking about buildings. Uh, and of course, if you were to ask, you know, where is the wedding of so-and-so, very often they would answer with something like, oh, it's on at the church on the corner of Sylvan and Holt Road, for instance. And again, what they're referring to is actually the, the hall in which that community of believers meets. You see, you, you say church and people are usually thinking about a structure a structure that rests on a foundation structure that's often built of stones or bricks and one that of course rises up into the sky you might recognize the one that's there of course and yet the funny thing is they are both entirely wrong and completely right at the same time how so well as we come to the final part in this three-week series, uh, we discover that the church really is a building. God says it really is a building, but it's not the kind of building that we've been talking about, is it? It's a spiritual building, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And again, the take-home message for today is it's an image that speaks of status and purpose. That's what this image is about status and purpose because you see firstly this living uh, spiritual building is built upon a foundation the foundation is the gospel of christ uh, listen to these words from 1 corinthians 3 that we looked at not too long ago the apostle paul wrote this of his ministry he says according to the grace of god given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation 
and someone else is building upon it, let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then in Ephesians 2, uh, Paul writes, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. You see, God's church has a foundation. It's Jesus. Uh, But it can also be described as the message about Jesus, as in the gospel. Because you might have noticed in Ephesians 2, uh, that foundation now includes the gospel's first messengers, the apostles and the prophets, with Jesus as the cornerstone. You see, it's the gospel. That is the foundation of God's church. Now, why does that matter? Well, it tells us where churches come from. That's why it matters. You see, a church is born and grows where the gospel, the message of Jesus, is proclaimed and where people respond in faith to Jesus. Uh, Because, you see, a community can be built on all sorts of things, can't it? I mean, you can build a community on a love of football, quilting, uh, environmental conservation, even just having a baby, right? That forms mother's groups. And that's a little community of sorts, isn't it? But what creates this community? This community and others like it? Well, it's not a shared interest in 70s architecture and Arnott's biscuits, even if that's what it might look like occasionally. It's the message of Jesus, right? The Son of God who died for sins, who was raised to life, who rules from heaven and will return as judge and saviour. That's the message, the news that founds this community. And you know this is true, actually, because if you are a Christian, then at some point Jesus has addressed you through his word by the Spirit. He has brought you to trust him, and that's why you're here. You see, the gospel, that's what's brought us together, isn't it? It's the gospel that founds God's church. Which again raises an important implication, as each week has. Uh, Today, you see, if there's only one foundation of God's church, the gospel of Jesus, well, that means not every group called church is actually one. Do you see what I'm saying? If there's only one foundation of God's church, and that's the gospel of Jesus, then not every group that wears the label church is actually a church, not a church of God anyway. So if we are to look around us at the world out there, it's important for us to realise we mustn't be too quick to embrace everything that mentions Jesus and just assume they are Christians, right? After all, many speak about Jesus. They don't know him as Lord. And they certainly don't accept his claims to be the only way to the Father, the only name by which we must be saved. And so before you hitch your wagon to something, make sure it's the Jesus of Scripture, that it's his gospel that they stand for. Right? Because that, that's the only foundation of God's church. It's the gospel. And so if we're then to look inwards perhaps at our own community that helps us realize that gospel-centered christianity which in our neck of the woods is called evangelical christianity it's not a preference or a version of christianity is it it's actually the only type for without the gospel well we're a group but we're just another group that might be nice but isn't God's church, right? We might be a group that's very friendly to be around, but without the gospel, we're just another group. We're not a church. Now, in practice, that means that how we do our church gatherings, many things are up for grabs, right? Uh, The clothes we wear, the buildings we meet, the uh, format of our services, the music, even what day of the week we meet, that's actually up for grabs. But... The gospel is not up for grabs. 
The gospel is not up for grabs. If we lose the gospel, we lose our foundation. If we lose our foundation, well, we might stand as a group, a community for a while, but we will not stand in eternity. See, God's building only has one foundation. That foundation is the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We mustn't get that wrong. The second point then, as God's church, we are a particular type of building. We are a temple. Now, it might actually amuse you, it amused me, to hear that Christianity's earliest opponents they actually called us atheists. Sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? Christianity's earliest opponents called us atheists. People like the Roman historian uh, Tacitus in the first century, he referred to Christians as impious atheists. And why was that? Well, it was because Christians, of course, rejected the gods, of which Rome had many. Uh, they didn't have elaborate ceremonies as part of their uh, religious worship. And, really importantly, they didn't build temples. Christians didn't build temples. But, of course, why would they? Because we read in 1 Corinthians 3, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. See, we don't need temples, do we? Because we have one already. Guess what? It's us. We are God's temple. And not in that kind of vegan diet, yoga, worship my body because it's a temple kind of way. Not that. No, we are temples of God. Meaning that this is set aside for worship of him. And actually together, we are the building, as in this community, is the building where the world sees and meets Jesus. We don't need ornate buildings. We are that thing where the world sees and meets God. We are a temple. Now, does that somehow diminish God to say that he dwells in us and not in some big building? Uh, certainly some people think we're missing out because we don't have ornate structures with echoey chambers that guide our eyes upwards and are filled with gold leaf walls and things like that. But they couldn't be more wrong to think that this diminishes God, to say he dwells in us. Because you see, temples actually have two functions. Temples bring you to God and they keep you away wonder if you realise that. In fact, that's exactly what Israel's temple in the Old Testament was designed to do. You see, the layout, here's a little you know, model of it that someone's put together. The layout of this temple contained elaborate series of walled courtyards because in the middle of the temple complex was the Holy of Holies, the place where God's presence dwelt. Now, you could not go in there. You couldn't go in there. In fact, only the high priest could, and only once a year. And when he went in, they tied a rope around his ankle so that if he died, they could haul his dead body out of there without anyone else going behind the curtain, lest it happen to them too. You see, temples, whilst they announce, yeah, God is real, he exists, come meet him, they also announce very clearly distance, exclusion, God is holy and you are not. But when Jesus died on the cross, what happened? Something totally remarkable. That curtain in the temple that marked off the Holy of Holies was literally torn in two from top to bottom, announcing that sin is dealt with. Come on in. The way is open. Isn't that incredible? You see, is God somehow less magnificent because he sent stone temples to the garbage bin of history? No, surely he is more. He is more magnificent 
because he has done something so comprehensive by the cross of Christ that the one who is too holy, too pure to dwell with sin can now call me, me his home, wretched Andy. Isn't that remarkable? I wonder if you ever feel distant from God. Do you ever feel that way? Are you ever worried that your prayers are ignored, that God's not listening, that he's left you somehow? Well, brothers and sisters, yeah, our feelings can be fickle. Praise God that he is not. Because with Christ as Lord, as a temple of his spirit, God's not lying when he says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. There is no distance when we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that remarkable? However, being his temple, of course, brings with it expectations, different expectations about how we live. Uh, when Nicole and I uh, went to Thailand for our honeymoon, we did all the kind of usual, typical touristy things. We rode elephants. I ate a lot of cashews at a cashew factory. It was delicious. And, of course, we ended up at some temples because there's plenty of them in Thailand. Uh, now, unlike the cashew factory, when we entered the temple, there were certain expectations. Shoes had to come off, right? Uh, the hats had to come off. As you can see, I often need to wear a hat. And uh, women who were wearing shorts were given a shawl to then wrap around their legs for the sake of modesty. You see, they believed that we were in the presence of a God. And so it was expected that we behave with a certain reverence and purity in that temple. Well, brothers and sisters, whilst our relationship with God is drastically different to that uh, one that they understood in Thailand... The same is true of God's temple, us. Those same ideas of holiness and purity. Uh, we heard just a few weeks ago, we're going back to 1 Corinthians a lot, aren't we? Chapter 6, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now, as a, just a brief recap, sexual immorality is, of course, all sex outside of the man-woman marriage relationship that God designed. Because sex has a purpose. Sex has a purpose to bind husbands and wives together in love and to form a new family. That's what it's for. But since our world clearly sees views, uh, views sex differently to that, why should we persist with such outdated notions? Right? Why not just shut up and be like the world around us? Well, it's not because we're scared of God or we think he's trying to deprive us of something good. No, no. Actually, we know that God is kind, that his ways are always good. And as his temple, we're meant to stand out from the world around us. We're meant to reveal him and his character to the watching world. We are holy because he is holy. You see, holiness means distinct. It means different. And so that is what we're called to be. As temples, we look different to the world around us. Now, of course, holiness means more than just sexual purity, but it certainly isn't less than that. And so, brothers and si sisters, as God's temple, we are to speak to and think of one another with absolute purity, as we saw a couple of weeks ago in the family of God. We're to reject pornography. We should uphold our marriage vows and continue in celibacy if unmarried uh, and repent should we fail. But God has loved us enough to make us his home. So we are called, as his temple, to honour God with our bodies, lives that reflect him. And so here we go so far. We're a building founded on the gospel, a holy 
temple where God dwells, the last thing to grasp about being God's building is that it is also a work in progress. It's a work in progress. Now, I don't think you have to look too hard to see that this building could do with some work. I mean, there's always things that could be fixed up and the downside of owning property is always maintenance, isn't it? But maintenance is not what I'm getting at here. All right, not what I'm getting at. We're not talking about maintenance. Actually, God's building is always under construction. This side of glory, of course. Uh, as we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, did you notice there, the work is incomplete. We are being built into this spiritual house, but the house isn't finished yet. There's work to do. However, just like a house uh, that's being built, this construction happens both up and out. Okay, it goes up and out. Uh, listen to 1 Corinthians 14, where the apostle says, What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpreter interpretation. The irony of getting that wrong. There you go. Let all things be done for building up. Now, when we come together as, as God's building, what are we doing? We are building up. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that when we gather like this, we come to strengthen the components of the building. That is, one another, you and me. Uh, and we do that by speaking the word of God to one another in the readings, in the sermon, in the songs, and in conversation. Right? We kind of take God's multi-purpose tool, which is the word of God, and we apply it to one another. Right, to, to shore up the strong bits, the faithful bits, and of course to sand back the rot in one another. We're taking God's multi-purpose tool, we're applying it to the bricks that are part of God's building. That's what church is about. Now again, whilst we're risking going into online life again, can you see that that's not ideal, is it? And receiving only through online as your preference, doesn't really allow you to be part of the building of one another, does it? There's something lacking there. See, we meet together to build each other, build each other like Christ. But we do it so that when we depart, we're ready to build out. We're ready to build out. Back in that passage in 1 Peter 2, uh, further along we read this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. See, God's building us, we have a song to sing, right? And it's a bit like the siren's call. That is, as we sing the praises of our God, declare his wonders, the God who loves and saves through Jesus, well, actually, his spirit is at work building others into this house. That's what's happening. We actually have a goal as a community when we're apart. What is that? It is to build out. That's what we're doing. Uh, when I was a a second year as a physio grad uh, working at Nepean Hospital. Uh, God brought along a new grad who happened to live only a, a suburb away from me. Even though I lived an hour away from Nepean Hospital, she lived a suburb away from me. So, of course, it made a great deal of sense to carpool together. Uh, now, I don't think I ever gave Jane a gospel tract or uh, used any particular catchphrase to steer the conversation to Jesus. <clears throat> but over the next year of being stuck in a car next to each other for at least two hours every day, you can imagine multiple conversations uh, turned to 
faith and Jesus. And by God's grace, Jane became a Christian. It was a great privilege to see that unfold and to uh, go along to her wedding. Uh, Brothers and sisters, I share this not because it's unique or I'm special, but because that's actually just the normal part of being part of God's building. Uh, As his church, we share Jesus. When we're not here, and we don't live here, right? We're only here for an hour or so a week. When we're not here, we are building out. That is who we are. See, when we are together, we build up. When we're apart, we build out. And what a wonderful opportunity Christmas presents, right? You see, God's building, us, is always under construction. It's not just being maintained. It is always under construction, this side of glory. And so to finish one last time, let's think about this building again, the building that is Sylvania Anglican Church. Uh, Because if we are God's building and a temple of the Spirit, how can we better resemble who we are? Uh, I wonder if you remember the words I've left you with the last couple of weeks, the three C's from week one. Does anyone want to give it a go? Put on my teacher face. Three C's. I'll give you, give you some help. Cognition, commitment, courage. Do anyone remember last week's three R's? You're consulting your notes, Laurie. I'll permit it, though. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> no, that's good. Wonderful. Radical. Excellent. That was the third one. Ready, regular, radical. Now, this week, I've actually got three Ps because you could put it together as a sort of dyslexic church CPR if you like. (laughs) Three Ps for you to remember as we finish our series on church. And those three Ps are, firstly, pray, right? Pray, that's the first one. You see, I hope you've been excited as I have to discover God's vision for his church. But I suspect you can also, as I have, see the gap between who God's made us to be and what we appear to be often. Friends, can I urge you to, rather than be dismayed, to pray for our church, and perhaps especially when you're feeling dismayed or see that gap being bigger than usual. You see, pray for our church in light of what we've discovered today. Pray that we as a community will cling to the gospel. Pray that we will live holy lives that are distinctive and different to the world around us and pray that God will use each of us to build his church in this suburb. Can I encourage you to pray for our church? I wonder when you do that in your week, is there a day or a time in your program when you pray for our church? If not, please start. Please pray. The second P, Proclaim, right? Because you too are a builder. You're a builder. You're a building and you're a builder. And you're a brick and you're a builder. But you're a builder. You might doubt your eloquence when it comes to Christian things. You may doubt your ability to answer all the questions. But you actually don't need a slick presentation to share Jesus. In fact, the most powerful evangelistic tool is your own account of why you follow Jesus. So why do you? Why do you follow him? Who is he? What is the wonderful things that he's done for you? Why is it such great news? If you can answer those questions, and I actually think you can, then you've got all the tools you need. And who knows, when you're stuck in a car next to someone for an hour or whenever it is, And they ask you, why do you go to church on Sunday? As you answer those questions, well, maybe you're actually applying a little bit of mortar in your answer. And through your words, God is starting to build that person into his house. Once again, of course, Christmas provides many opportunities for easy ways to talk about Jesus, invite people to come, Proclaim Jesus. That's our second P. But the third P as we finish our series is really just to praise God. To actually acknowledge with thanks uh, 
the gift that is church. Praise God that you have a family. Praise God that you are a necessary member of the body of Christ. Praise God that he has made his home in you. You see, we need to praise God who has loved us enough to call us, to unite us, to use us for his glory. As we remember who we are, God's church, we, pro- we pray, we proclaim, and we praise him. I'm going to do that right now. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the gift of church. Thank you that we do not do this Christian life alone. Thank you that you have delighted to call us to yourself and to one another, that you have made us your very own people. And as you're building, you are doing great things through us. We give you great thanks for this church here. And we pray, Father, that you will continue to uh, radically change us, that you might make us more like Jesus and use us to grow your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Andy. Our singers are coming up now to lead us uh, in singing our second hymn, Christ is Made the Sure Foundation. It's it's an old hymn, but it's a hymn that uh, reflects the teaching of 1 Peter and reflects the fact that uh, we are... uh, the temple of God, built into Christ and growing in him. And so please stand as we sing together.
please be seated, everyone. We come now to share in the Lord's Supper together. And uh, as we've done in previous weeks, uh, we're going to pray a prayer that is appearing on the screen now. And uh, this is a prayer that prepares, helps us to prepare our hearts and minds uh, spiritually for what we're going to share in together in this remembrance and fellowship meal that we call the Lord's Supper. Let's pray this together. Gracious Lord, we are not worthy to eat the crumbs from under your table, but your love compels us to draw near. We come with repentance and faith to express our need for all the benefits of your Son's death for us. Renew us in your spirit and help us to love one another as members of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And drink this in remembrance that Christ shed his blood for you and be thankful. In Romans 12, the Apostle Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We're going to stand and sing our third hymn. Uh, this morning, another great Christmas carol, O Come, All You Faithful. Please stand.
please be seated, everyone. Some church family uh, announcements uh, before we conclude uh, with the blessing this morning. Uh, most of our announcements today have to do with Christmas, of course, but uh, firstly, this uh, short uh, announcement from John Emmett. Uh, John has some current Wollongong Regional Prayer Diaries. If you would like one, please see John after the service. Um, friends, in regards to Christmas, uh, I've got something to say, then Andy, and then back to me. Uh, firstly, uh, at this stage, uh, all our preparations for Christmas, all our organisation is going forward uh, as uh, we have been planning for some time now. And so continue to pray for all the services that will be happening uh, Christmas Eve and uh, Christmas Day, God willing, uh, this week. And um, uh, if you are on email, uh, check your email a couple of times a day. It's not a bad idea between now and Christmas Eve and we'll inform you of any uh, changes uh, to our plans. But at this stage, everything is normal and uh, we're moving forward uh, as planned. Uh, keep praying and keep inviting your friends. Keep registering for the services. More about that in a few moments. If you're not on email, then uh, give someone who you know in our congregation who is on email a call, uh, you know, maybe on Tuesday, uh, and uh, uh, just to check in with them to see if there's any emails that have been sent to update about any developments. But as I've mentioned, all things moving forward um, as normal as uh, we've uh, gotten to know normal uh, at this time. So, Andy? My uh, announcement is simply to encourage you to continue to book online and to encourage your friends and family to do so. Plenty of space is still available, but the booking online ensures that we have the contact details that we need to be COVID safe uh, and saves us having to f uh, faff around with it at the door on the way in. So please do uh, book online, encourage your friends and family to book online prior to coming and we really look forward to seeing you on, what is it, Thursday, Wednesday and Thursday. I don't know. We're Thursday, Friday. It's all just a big blur. It's happening very soon. <laughs> Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Yeah, that's right. Whatever day they fall. <laughs> Friends, uh, a couple of further things about Christmas. Uh, at Christmas time, all our giving at our Christmas services is directed to the uh, welfare Christian welfare agencies that we're in partnership with, Anglican Aid and Anglicare. And so uh, if you would like to donate to the work of Anglican Aid and Anglic Anglican Anglicare and Anglican Aid this Christmas, then please do so. Um, you'll be able to do that at the service. Each service we're going to allow time for people to do it on the spot uh, in the service with their digital devices. Um, but you can do it prior to or after our Christmas services online. Uh, using the details that are on the screen here. Um, make sure, though, that you uh, indicate uh, in any sort of bank transfer, uh, if you can place the words Christmas giving, Christmas giving, uh, on the reference to that bank transfer, that will allow our wardens to know that that money uh, is to be directed specifically for Anglicare and Anglican Aid as part of our Christmas service uh, support of those agencies this year. The other thing I wanted to say about Christmas is that Christmas services are actually not simply for us, for those who regularly attend church. Uh, they're for people who we have been inviting to church and people who just come in uh, to our gatherings at Christmas time. Um, this year, of course, things will be a bit different. You'll notice that the seats have changed a bit uh, since last Sunday. Uh, you already know that there are various uh, COVID uh, restrictions uh, that we've had to live under at this time. Uh, if there's any changes to those, any further changes to those things, we'll let you know via email before uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. But can I just encourage you as regular attenders to come early to our Christmas services, okay? Coming, if you come on the hour to our Christmas services, it will, it will place our ushers under great stress this year, okay? So please come a quarter of an hour before the service at least. That will be very, very helpful uh, for our ushers at our five services. Uh, also, uh, we'll have a sanitizer station uh, uh, positioned 
out in the courtyard. So uh, uh, obviously use that on, on your way in. And uh, please just wait patiently for our ushers to usher, to usher you to your seats at Christmas. But if you as regular members of our congregations could come at least 15 minutes early to our services, that's going to help people considerably and will help our ushers with, with the large number of people that will come either on the hour or after uh, the service actually begins. And so uh, uh, these services are not like any others that we have during the year, and so uh, uh, treat them a bit differently to how you might treat a Sunday service. Let me close our time with the words of the blessing before I hand over to, to Meryl. May the peace of God this Christmas keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. Thanks, Meryl.